Let's do it now. Turn up the volume nice and loud. Because we, we are controlling transmission. You're in the mix with Lil Drummer Girl. With your host, Dawn Marie. Hey, it's Dawn Marie here. Welcome to another episode of The Little Drummer Girl. Please note that there is some explicit language in this episode, so if you've got the little ones around, you might want to put on some headphones. I'm so fired up today because today's guest is DJ Rye Toast. One of the coolest DJs in the house. She's an L.A.-based DJ. She grew up in New Jersey in the 90s, and her style is strongly rooted in New York hip-hop, but her sound has no boundaries. She lives for feel-good music and loves digging for funk, soul, and R&B. She has played with hip-hop heavy hitters such as DMX, Nas, Wu-Tang Clan, and Master Ace. She's worked with top brands like Nike, Adidas, Puma, and Lululemon. In 2015, she played New L.A.'s biggest New Year's Eve party at Grand Park for over 50,000 people. She's also one-third of L.A. hip-hop group Tyrone's Jacket, and she also has a DJ truck, Sweet Beats L.A. She's an artist in every sense of the word, whether she's crafting the perfect DJ set, working on a beat or remix, writing a rhyme, styling a photo shoot, building props, or just drawing. We have so much to cover today, so let's get Rye on the line. Hey, Rye, how's it going? Hey, good. How are you doing? Great. Thanks so much for being here tonight. I know you have a really busy schedule, so thank you for taking the time out. Oh, of course. No problem. Thanks for having me. Tell me something. How did you get your name? It's such a cool name. Oh, my name? I don't think it's that cool. It's <laughs> been my name ever since I was a baby. My my name, name my government name is Ryan. So. Cool. Rye was the nickname, and then that turned into Rye Toast, and then Rye Wheat Toast, and then Rye Wheat Toast Master, and then Toast Master, and then Toast Face Killer, and just all these things. But Rye Toast was like the base nickname of all the nicknames. So when I realized I want to be a DJ, I had to think of a name, and I kept trying to think of cool names or names like I thought sounded like sexy or just like whatever. And um, no matter what I tried to call myself, everybody just called me Rye Toast. So I just so decided, stuck. hey, just, if you can't be the joint, then we'll just go with this. Seems I love like it. That's what the universe wants. That is awesome. How old were you when you began DJing? Well, I guess I started when I was 21. That was when I bought myself turntables for my 21st birthday. And I was just playing like in my bedroom and stuff for friends or house parties. And I had a couple of friends who were rappers, so they would come over and freestyle and I would just spin and start learning how to scratch and beat match. But um, I wasn't playing out. It was just like in my bedroom DJ. I'd say I started playing out later on. I was about 27 when I started like getting gigs and taking it more seriously. So, yeah. Nice. So what inspired you to become a DJ? Hmm. I just started getting so obsessed with hip hop around high school and I would spend all my babysitting money on like hip hop CDs like Nas, Biggie, Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, Red Man, Busta Rhymes. And then I went to college and I started getting to go to shows. So I'd spend my money from my, my job making pizza and sandwiches and spent it all on ticket to hip hop shows that were coming through our town in Burlington, Vermont. And I'll go early and I'd stand right in front of the stage and I would just try to soak up all the energy from everything that was going on, MCs, the DJs, the crowds. And I just felt like it just made me feel like me, like that that confidence, that swagger that hip hop breeds felt so good to me. It was like nothing I had never like experienced before. And um, I would always buy records at the shows, like they'd be selling shows at the merch table. So I started buying records, even though I didn't have turntables. I just really liked the way records felt and the way they looked in my house. And um, I was just like so into hip hop. I, I really wanted to get closer to it, like to get into it and not just be like watching from the sidelines. So I was thinking like how, you know, I was looking at hip hop shows and thinking, how could I be, how could I be a part of that? Like, I don't really see myself as a rapper. I don't produce, I don't graph right, I don't like really dance like B-girl or anything. Um, So that just 
kind of was like, okay, well, you could DJ. And I was like, kind of sat with that idea for a minute and then decided I was going to make it happen. And then when I turned 21, I bought, I spent all my savings on turntables. (laughs) And that was just like when it, when it started, I think it was just hip hop that, that really inspired me to, to want to get in the game. And, And I saw DJing as my, my ticket in. Did you, did you study with a DJ to learn how to, or did you teach yourself how to do it? In the beginning, I, I really was on my own. Um, I kind of isolated myself, I think, because I was such a beginner and I knew it and I wasn't ready to kind of like flex any skills in front of people. And um, I learned a lot by like listening to other DJs and I worked in bars and, and stuff. So I, I got to hear DJs constantly, which is definitely part of my education. But I, I was really like on my own until recently. I started going last year to um, the Beat Junkies Institute of Sound. And once I moved to the to the West Coast and started really pursuing DJing, I learned about the Beat Junkies. And they were this crew of DJs in L.A. who seemed like they were just like super friends, like amazing DJs, like awesome crew of people. And they were doing things with records and turntables that I'd never seen before, heard before. They would tour together and do shows where each of them, I think there's like seven or eight, would all be playing it, playing turntables like instruments. And it was just blowing my mind that I was a DJ and those guys were DJs, but like I couldn't even understand what they were doing. That's how advanced they were. And wow. So when they opened up a DJ school last year in L.A., after I had moved to L.A., I was like, this is a sign. Like, I need to go and learn from these people. So I've been going to them for almost a year. I think they I think they opened in April. In a lot of ways, I feel like kind of almost like just start. I'm just starting over because of the way they have taught me to, like, listen to music and break it down and, and how you can really use each element of, like, a sound on a record and creative ways of mixing records together and it's just like it's infinite what you can do with music obviously because music is infinite so absolutely yeah so it's been so cool to like have what what you know little knowledge i have gathered through the years on my own and then to be in this container where um masters of the craft are actually just giving me what they've learned over the years it's just like you get your mind blown every time every time you walk in there. It's so cool. So I can only um, imagine. Yeah, yeah. So like self taught in the beginning, but um definitely had a lot of help this past year from from really, really dope masters of, of the whole culture. So how did you actually like book your first gig? <sighs> My first gig, okay, so remember I was telling you before I had friends that used to rap. And um, she would rap in my bedroom. She'd freestyle or kick little little verses she had written, and I would play like break beats and different instrumental records I had, and we kind of try to piece together little sets. And um, she booked a show at this little venue in the sticks in Vermont. Like we were going to school in in a city in Vermont. She booked a show like an hour outside the city in this town I had never even been to. And she needed a DJ. So I went and I think like everything went wrong. Like (laughs) the turntables, I don't, I think they both were broken. I'm pretty sure the mixer didn't work. There was no microphones. It was just like everything about the show went wrong. It was obviously very amateur and very like, you know, kids just throwing shit together, trying to make something. But like, that's what's so dope about hip hop to me is that that's what it is. It's right, homemade, right. it's do-it-yourself, it's rebel, it's punk, it's gutter. It's like, no one wants to listen to us. Well, we're going to make our own party <laughs> and throw it in the sticks. And, like, what happened was I didn't even really get to DJ. I think I played a couple of records. But before everything just kind of crapped out, they still put on their show. And there was a really cool vibe about it, even though everything was going wrong. And we ended up partying, but, like, having a really great night. and. I guess it just goes to show you, like, when it's real, it's real, and everything can go wrong. But, like, if that's what you're supposed to do, you're still going to have the best 
time and still going to maybe even see that as like what you do for the rest of your life. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Did you continue to gig after that or was it, you know, was there a time between? It's like yeah. kind of like an isolated thing. You know, not so long after that, I started dating this guy who was actually already a really established DJ in our little scene. And we were together for like two or three years. And weirdly, sadly, during that time, I totally put DJing aside because I felt like, okay, he's really good at that. Like, I need to have a different thing. And I think there was part of me that like didn't want him to see me like struggle through the beginning phases of DJing because maybe I thought like he wouldn't think that was cool or sexy or whatever. And instead of being vulnerable, I just was like, well, fuck it. I didn't really want to do that anyway. But I never sold my turntables or my record collection. So I think I held on to that for a reason. Like, I think I knew in the back of my mind, I'm going to, I am going to do this even if I'm not there yet. And of course, you know, I was young and, and we obviously broke up a long time ago and I took my records and I took my turntables and I moved to San Francisco and I was like, when I get here, I can be whoever I want. And if I want to be a fucking DJ, I'm going to be a fucking DJ. And I landed in San Francisco and that's when I started working and practicing and spending my time, like really taking this shit seriously and in my room and digging through records and buying records and going down to Amoeba on H Street and like digging through the dollar bin because I was like too broke to like get any new records. But like I was preparing for this gig that I didn't even have, but I didn't care because I was just telling everyone I was a DJ. And then of course, you know, you start saying it enough and then you meet the right person who's like, oh, well, I need you to, that was my first, my next first gig was Monday nights, obviously like the worst night of the week to party the deadest night of the week, Monday nights at this little bar in the Mission District of San Francisco called Double Dutch. <laughs> and it had big wall of boom boxes. And when I moved to San Francisco, one of my friends was like, I got to take you to this bar because it's got boom boxes all over it. You're going to love it. And I walked in and of course I did love it. And it all kind of just spiraled from there. And that was like my night in San Francisco, Monday nights. Sweet. How long did you do that for? I did that for years and then kind of used it as a platform to like get other gigs in San Francisco and expose myself and to other DJs and like have other DJs come in and play that night and just get to know the scene a little bit. And it was a huge springboard for me into like where, where DJing was like what I did in San Francisco, you know, full time. And it took a minute. I had to do, I had to waitress and hostess and I had to bartend and, I was also teaching yoga a lot of the time, but it just grew slowly and steadily. I love that. See, and that's yeah. why I, I always say, you know, it's so important because it's like some people don't want to start stuff because they feel like it's not going to be perfect. But I always feel like, you know, it's progress over perfection. So, you know, totally. just keep at it. You just keep at it. And, you know, before you know it, there it is. You know, it may take a while. Yeah. But <laughs> eventually it'll so, come you're up. You're so right. I've noticed that so many times. And I always think about like how I, I didn't even pursue DJing while I was with that guy. And I, I cause I, cause I didn't want to not be good. And it was like, man, if I had started then and, and I had had his coaching while I was also learning, like, you know, I just think like if I had just started, it would have been okay. And at, right, and he now, might have been really thrilled that you looked to him yeah, to, to yeah, see, you know, out as a mentee. I'm sure he just, yeah, and he just would have probably helped me get gigs and just, that I was just too, like, in my head and in my fears. And there's always going to be a reason not to do something. But, like, if you really want to do it, you're never going to feel ready enough. You just got to, like, trust yourself and go for it and, like, be okay with it not being perfect and just I don't know you just got to do it I'd rather like I always think about sharks like they just stay swimming all the time and I think if you're constantly like at least trying to grow or trying to move forward yeah you might hit a wall or make a mistake here and there but I'd rather like at least be trying something than just like not doing anything 
Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And I've also learned <laughs> to add to that is that, you know, you have to make some mistakes along the way because without those mistakes, you just don't learn. So I think it's really Absolutely. important to make and them. And, why, you know, yeah. And they don't even really seem like mistakes. Once you look back and say, Oh, well, if I hadn't have done that, I never would have like met this person or learned this thing. So at the end of the day, there aren't really any mistakes. Absolutely. So what um, kind of DJ equipment do you use? My favorite equipment to use is Technique Turntables, two of them, and a Pioneer um, SM9 mixer. That's like this, it's like last year's mixer, but it's really, really just perfect for me. I love it. It's got big buttons and bright colors and an awesome crossfader, and it's just very straightforward, and it just works so well. That sounds fun. So, I mean, I was blown away when I caught you guys, uh, Tyrone's jacket, uh, when you guys opened up for the Dirty Heads um, a few months ago. So, how did you hook up with Tyrone's jacket? Tyrone's jacket, um, how did I hook up with them? Well, in a word, I could just say prophecy. (laughs) I love it. But um, I could also tell the long version. (laughs) Yes, please do. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Okay, so I'll start with Carl and Noah because they've known each other since Little League. Um, They, like, grew up together in Beverly Hills, and their dads coached them in baseball, and they've just – they just grew up around each other. Um, They both did music, but they did it separately, like, on their own projects. And, um, yeah, so they've just kind of always known each other. And then um, Noah and I – actually met randomly at a festival called lightning in a bottle um yeah he was there performing with another group called liberation movement and i was there as a featured yoga teacher so i had like taught my class and afterwards i was just walking around it's like a really cool atmosphere i think i was wearing like a bathing suit and like a headdress and some like cortez's And I'm just, like, walking around, feeling great. The sun is shining. It's, like, beautiful people everywhere I look. And um, I walked by Noah, and he stopped me, and he asked me if um, about a tattoo I have on my arm, which is of uh, an MC named Rakim. He looked at me, and he was like, is that Rakim on your arm? (laughs) And I was was like, yeah. And he was like, respect, and gave me, like, a knuckle bump, and then we just kept (laughs) it moving. So I didn't really think anything of it. I was just like, oh, that's dope. Like, that kid must really know hip-hop because he recognized this tattoo. And, a, like, a, a lot of people don't. Don't, right. So I thought that was really cool. But then check this out. So then um, months later, I'm on Tinder, and I meet – I swipe right, and it's Carl. <laughs> <laughs> so we met I love it. And, and started chatting right away. And he, I'll never forget, he, like, invited me over to his house. He was like, let me cook you dinner. And right. and I heard my mom's voice in my head, like, no, meet in a public place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but I was just like, sure. And I came right over. And we have been, like, pretty much inseparable ever since. So we That's we, wonderful. like, met and we seriously fell in love within a week and like we've just had this most amazing love story but one of the first things that that we did where I was like oh this guy really likes me was he was like I'm going to take you to my friend's house he's having a couple people over and I was like wow like he wants to introduce me to his friends that's so cool okay I'm excited so we get in the car and we go over and we walk into this guy's house and everyone's in the backyard and there's like a barbecue and people are talking and there's a little cipher going on of people rapping and whose house is it but Noah no way <laughs> so I think awesome. I was wearing like a short sleeve shirt or something because he looked right at me and he was like Carl was like I want to introduce you to my you know girlfriend or I don't know what he said but to Ryan and we looked at each other and we were like we've met and um <laughs> yeah it was a really really cool moment because like we both recognize each other and uh, it was just like, dang, okay, well, that's pretty fucking interesting. 
And, <laughs> yeah, so love then, it. yeah, so Noah was just like Carl's friend that like I had this little bond with because we were both met at that scene and he's just like a, a great guy and obviously his talent was just so in your face. Now Carl kept his musical talent a little bit more like in his back pocket. He had a a career doing production and all this other stuff that he was really good at and music was like his hobby at the time. Um so anyway, we we keep dating and Noah started coming over more and more and then Carl had some time in between jobs and Noah and Carl ended up just messing around, hanging out one day and they made a song. And the song was like pretty catchy. So then they shot a video and then the video got some attention from some managers and some people in like this little scene and they booked a show and they needed a DJ for the show. So I was like, Oh, of course I'm going to DJ for you. Like, I love you. And (laughs) Noah, of course. So we, um, we went down and this was the first show we did was an in-store for Cutlass brand. And we were the opening act for an acoustic set by Duddy B. Oh, sweet. Yeah. So we met Mm -hmm. Duddy B basically on our first gig. Wow. he, He saw us perform and just, was really into it so we kind of had like a little secret fan in him from from the get-go very nice yeah so then we just they the guys kept booking more shows and i would keep djing for them but then like a few months into that we realized that the three of us had like this really unique energy together and they were basically like, you know, we want to keep doing this, but we want to do it as a group, not just like Mud Lux, Noah King. We want to do it as a group and call it like its own thing and have you be like a member in the group. And I was just like, oh my God, that's so fucking cool. Yes, let's do it. So what's the 411 on the name? Mm. The name is just like a weird a couple of words that we put together and we just thought it sounded cool and like we get it does. Of, <laughs> yeah we get so many questions about it and I love that because that's what I want I want people to like I want it to stick in people's minds like oh that doesn't just sound like another band what's up with that now that we've had the name for a while it's like kind of creating its own like meaning um which keeps changing so that's cool. So there's always like something to read into it, but really it just came from just us trying to think of something cool. <laughs> I guess it worked. <laughs> well, it worked. <laughs> I guess it's cool. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Good to know. Have you ever had any embarrassing moments on stage? Oh my God. So many. <laughs> um, Can you tell us at least one of them? Yeah, for sure. Oh my God. Okay. So on our last tour with Iration. Well, there's like so many little things that's going on constantly that like nobody else could even be conscious of, you know, like if you're not in the group on stage, like the shit, the eye stares we give each other and like the holy shit looks we give each other. <laughs> that I can never even explain because like they're just kind of all the time. But, um, Oh my God. So we were performing our song, Do That There, which is like one of our most lively rock and roll, like kind of like almost punk sounding songs. It's super upbeat. And Noah's doing all these crazy dance moves. Oh, I love that. And, yes. He was okay, awesome. Yeah, so that song, in the middle of that song, Noah kicked my power cord. So <gasps> I lost power and we lost all sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Noah, Noah was still singing and Carl's still playing. And and they were, like, looking at each other, like, uh, should we keep going? And meanwhile, I, like, for some reason, I just snapped into this super calm mode, realized exactly what happened, walked to the front of stage, and plugged it back in, and then started the song again. And it was, like, actually ended up being a pretty sweet moment because of the way that everybody handled it. Handled it. And Noah said something really charming, too, and Carl was, did something perfect. So, like, it ended up being, like, just... It ended up being awesome. It kind of probably loosened us up and made us even more comfortable and relaxed. But um, right, it was just, the worst is over. <laughs> right. Okay. The worst already happened. Now what can go wrong? Nothing. That's right. But it was oh, that's really cool. for for a few seconds for sure. 
<laughs> no, he was doing that. I mean, I was like so blown away by his dance moves. I was like, wow. I was like, is he a karate master? <laughs> what? What is he I doing? Think, it's awesome. <laughs> it's really good. Is, I think he could have been like a martial arts guru or like some kind of African tribal leader. Exactly. Uh, yeah, like his his moves are totally natural to him, but he doesn't like learn them or study them or anything. It's just I think he just does what feels good in his body, and that's what it looks like, and it's perfect. It's it rocks. It rocks. Yeah, and. Yeah. Um, and he looks a lot like Bar Marley. Oh my God, I know. And his middle name is, get that a lot? is Robert. He gets that all the time. Wow. It's like, it's kind of, we don't even like to talk about it because it's like so in your face. And um, it's almost like, it's kind of weird. Like, it is. people stop him on the street who knew Bob Marley who say, you know, not only that, that, that he looks like him, but like that there's a piece of, there's like a piece of his spirit, like with Noah, you know, and, and like, we all kind of believe it too. So. Yeah. It's funny you said that. Cause that's what I picked up <laughs> when I was, when I was talking to him, I'm like, wow, I feel like, like he's like Bob Marley's son or something. <laughs> you know? It's just, uh, there was a connection there for sure. Yeah. Uh, you're not the first person to, to pick up on that. Wow. That's really wild. Yeah. So who are you touring with now? I know you toured with uh, the Dirty Heads for a while and Iration and what so are you doing now? We don't we don't have anything um scheduled right now really for Tyrone's jacket. We we definitely want to go on a tour as soon as possible and uh I'm sure that it's going to happen. I just don't know with who right now. Gotcha. How long are you on the road with uh, Dirty Heads for? Dirty Heads was, a, I think it was about a four-week-long tour. Okay. And how did it feel? Because that was, that was your first uh, major tour, yes? Yeah, that was our first big one. It was, it was so awesome, and there was a huge learning curve, and it was really hard at times. But um, I think we were all like, okay. Because we had never toured together either, and I think on that tour we realized, like, we could do this because – we get along on that level. Like we love each other on that level. And it's, it's, it's that hard of a, of a hustle when it's just three people in a van. You really need to yeah, like, you really get close, don't you? <laughs> yeah. You, 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 yeah. you either get close or you, or you like, kill each other. <laughs> exactly. And we, we got really close as a unit. And, right. um, and then, so we knew what, what to expect on the iration tour. And we were able to kind of like gather a bunch of lessons, from the dirty heads and like bring them on the road with iration as well as like continuing to learn and, and grow and kind of sink into like our roles on the band, but also our roles just like in how we get along as people every day, all day. So it's just been this really amazing um, learning curve of like learning our craft as a band, our craft as individual musicians, but also like our own personal kind of self realizations and stuff too. I love that. Uh, do you do you um play any musical instruments? I know you had a a drum machine on stage with you. I wouldn't say I can really play any musical instruments. I can I just like like to dabble around and on everything, but I'm really focused right now on turntablism. So when it comes to like taking time to really learn an instrument i'm i'm down there with my turntable like trying to figure out cool ways to make different sounds out of like you know different scratches and different patterns and how i can use that art to like enhance a beat we're working on or a concept we're working on or a live set um i always want to be learning and i'm always going to be open to like everything but because my role in the band is is a DJ and I love like that's my first commitment that's like where I spend my time when it comes to like musicianship sure that makes perfect sense and I feel like I'm kind of just at the beginning of that journey too it's not like I've been studying turntablism even though I've been DJing I haven't had this attitude about it or this like kind of view on it for very long so in a lot of ways I feel like a beginner and there's just so much 
so much to learn and it's so interesting and it's like I'm passionate about it. So it's great. <laughs> That's wonderful. I yeah. I hope you guys come back to town again so I can uh, catch your show again because it was just so it was so much fun. It really was. Thank you. I know that we we definitely want to come back too. We want to do. This is just the beginning. We look at it for us. That's right. I know there's lots more to come from you guys. Exactly. <laughs> and I can't wait. So I'm gonna change topics for one quick second because I love your art uh, on your tattoos that you have, especially the cassette tapes, and that really caught my attention. Do you know, like, how many hours of work did you actually have to uh, get all that done? No, I have no idea. But I keep getting asked this question, so I feel like I should try to add it up at one point. (laughs) The thing that I don't want to think about is how much it costs for me to take all this pain. That's really the number that I don't want to face ever in my life. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't think about that part. <laughs> I think that's why, like, I I like have trouble sitting down to try and count because I just think about, oh my god, well, that was like another grand. That was five hundred bucks. That was six hundred bucks. Wow. <gasps> how how yeah, long? Like a down of a to have, I swear. <laughs> Could imagine. Yeah, they aren't they aren't cheap. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, how uh, would you say that? Like, how many years? Do you think it's been from from when you first got your first tattoo to where you are today? Um, let's see. I got one tattoo when I was 23, and that was kind of like an isolated thing. And then I started I started getting tattoos pretty regularly around like 28, I'd say. So that's about that was about six years ago. So when you say regularly, are you saying like every month you'd go and get something Sometimes. new done? Wow. Ideally, I would love to go every month, but um, there's definitely been really consistent streaks of that type of regularity. Or like, for instance, this past year, I worked on a back piece and I, I think I had about a session a month and it was like seven or eight sessions. So wow. that's like, you know, it's like a few hours of tattooing every month. Um, yeah, so that I guess that that is pretty regularly. For me. What's the the longest amount of time that you had to sit for one tattoo? I think my Rock Him, my portraits, like my Rock Him and my Stevie and my Tupac were all about uh, just under six hours, which was wow. I can't do that anymore. But at the time, I could. Um, but now I can only do like maybe three hours before I kind of tap out. You, I think your pain tolerance just changes when you get older. Yeah, absolutely. We could do a lot more and, yeah, when we're younger than we can. That's for sure. That's yeah, for and you're smarter when you're older, too. You're like, what the fuck am I still doing here? This <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so funny. Oh, my goodness. So tell me something. Are you ready for the 11 stroke rapid fire interview? Oh, yes. Yes, I love this part. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, cool. Your favorite food? Pizza. Your favorite travel spot? Ooh, Bali. Nice. Your favorite person to hang out with? Definitely Mudluck. <laughs> Your favorite genre of music? Hip-hop, all day. Do you have a favorite article of clothing that you cannot leave home without when you're on the road? Obviously my Tyrone's jacket. Your <laughs> <laughs> favorite music to listen to when you're not working? Um... That's hard. It changes a lot, but um, I really like funk music, like as a genre. It always makes me happy. Oh. Something you can't live without. Um, vegetables. Your biggest pet peeve. Long fingernails. Your favorite pastime when you're not working, Tori. Um, I love yoga and I love cooking and arts and crafts too. Very cool. Your favorite cocktail. Mm. Um, anything with like mezcal. Tequila? Yeah, it's like tequila, but it's got this like smoky flavor. It's kind of spicy. It's really good. Oh, cool. Yeah, tequila I'm also. I, tequila is, um, tequila is a staple. I'll put it that way. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Vinyl or CDs? Vinyl, of course. All right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for playing that. You're welcome.
So, well, it looks like we're just about out of time for today. Uh, how can our listeners stay in touch with you? Are you on social media? I know you had a website out there. Can you tell us um, what your handles are for your Twitter or if you have Twitter or Facebook? Or yeah, all my handles are, are really super consistent. It's just Rytos, so R-Y-T-O-A-S-T, at Rytos on Instagram, DJRytos.com on um, the World Wide Web. <laughs> Okay. And of course, Tyrone's Jacket at Tyrone's Jacket or Tyrone'sJacket.com is also a great way to stay in the loop. Beautiful. I will make sure I put the uh, links to those in the show notes as well. And oh, okay, cool. I really okay. hope that you can let us know when you are um, back on tour or anything like that so that maybe we can just let people know as well. That would be awesome. Yeah, I I would definitely would, you know, any support would be super, super appreciated. and. As soon as we get something and we can talk about it, we will be. So stay tuned. Beautiful. And I wanted to let listeners out there know that I did post a video of you guys from the show uh, at Janice Landing. So be sure to check out the Little Drummer Girl on YouTube channel. Just look for the Little Drummer Girl with Domri Mutel and check out Tyrone's Jacket Live in Action. And I will also be sure to put that link in the show notes as well. So check it out, listeners. Cool. Thanks, Don. Ah, my pleasure. Well, bye. Thanks again. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope to see you back in the sunny state soon. For sure. We'll be there. <laughs> and thank you, listeners, for listening. Check out the website at littledrummergirl.com to subscribe so that you don't miss out any episodes. And don't forget, it's never too late to begin to live the life of your dreams and leave a trailblazing behind. So rock on and rock out, and I'll catch you on the flip side.